firstborn citizen, how would that make you feel? And this is the church stats. The church is saying, you're not welcome. Now, they may not say that from the pulpit. They may not say it from the front. And they may think in their hearts that they really are a welcoming church. Only 42% actually stated. Now, you think, when you take a survey, they actually say that most people try to pick the right answer. It's not always a good uh, uh, depiction of what they really believe because most, especially Christians, want to choose the right answer. So you would think on a survey, if the survey actually said that Jesus was on there and you're talking to Christians, that they would check it without even reading the rest of it, without even thinking about it, they just would check, yep, that's right. But only 42% actually said it presents an opportunity to introduce them to Jesus. Just 12% of Christians, this was the most troubling of them all, actually said that their views on the arrival of refugees and other immigrants are primarily informed by the Bible. So what that's telling me is that most members are looking to other sources besides the Bible to come to their viewpoints on how they stand on these issues. And as a pastor, I'd have to say, I've never preached a sermon on this before. And the last church I just preached it at said they never heard a sermon on this before. You won't be able to say that after today. In fact, did you know that Jesus himself was a refugee? Look with me at Matthew chapter 2, and it's going to be on the screen. I'm trying to help you guys out, but feel free to look in your Bible. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. You guys know the story from the Christmas time when you usually read it. Right? And said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Rise, or and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child for what purpose? To kill him, to destroy him. And so he arose and he took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. Now was Jesus and his family invited to Egypt? Did they get an official invitation? Did they have proper documentation to come in through customs or did they go in by night? In fact, I'm so thankful that they were welcomed there. At least that's what the Egyptian Coptic Christians tell us, that they were very welcoming to Jesus' family. But let's define what a refugee really is, because there's a lot of confusion on this. In fact, I was talking to the kids at our school here, and they didn't seem to know what a refugee was. So we must not be really talking about it too much. A refugee is a person who has fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution on account of their race, religion, political opinion, national origin, or social group. So if they were under major distress facing situations like Jesus was, possibly extermination, then they are considered a refugee. Now just guess how many people qualify for that in the world. It's on there in small print. 25.4 25.4 million people. I mean, if nothing else, shouldn't we be praying for them? These are people that are being persecuted for no other reason than the color of their skin, persecuted for no other reason than their political origin or their, their, their religious thought process, wanting to be exterminated. Now let's get one thing straight before we go too far. A refugee that's here in America is a legal American. Do you know that? They were invited here, they are documented, and they are legal, even if they can't speak a word of English. Refugees and other immigrants are made in the image of who? In the image of God, and possess inherent dignity and potential. Notice this well-known verse in Genesis, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image 
after our likeness. The original word there for man is mankind. So that, re- that means every single person of every single background, every single nation, creed, language, and color, or we're made in the image of our God. And being made in the image of God, they're entitled to the respect and help of our church. Yes or no? So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Here's some interesting facts, and I think we should look at facts and not look at what people are thinking or saying. Out of all the Fortune 500 companies, does anybody know what a Fortune 500 company is? Go ahead, tell me what it is. The top 500, yeah, that's right, okay. So it's a very well-established, well-profitable company, right? Out of all the Fortune 500 companies, 40% of them were actually founded or co-founded by an immigrant or an immigrant's child. But they're a burden to us. 20 years after the arrival of a immigrant, a refugee, the average refugee adult has contributed approximately 21,000 more in taxes than they received in governmental assistance and service at all levels. So they've actually tracked this, and as they've come into the country, yes, there is a cost to helping these poor people who are being persecuted, who are being uh, threatened with their lives, who are living for years in camps with limited supplies and always with the threat over their shoulder that they might not see the next day. And these refugees are often split from their family. Sometimes mothers come and give birth to children that their fathers may never see. But in all levels, within 20 years span, they have contrib- they've paid all that back and given 21,000 more on average. Almost all economists believe that the net economic impact of immigration on the U.S. is actually positive. It's almost universal agreement, including 96% of economists surveyed by the Wall Street Journal who believe that the net economic impact of illegal immigrants is positive. Now, there's a difference between illegal immigrants and refugees, yes or no? But even if we talk about illegals, there's a lot of false information out there. In fact, contrary to widespread misconception, immigrants who are unlawfully present cannot receive federal means. There's all sorts of people who say, oh, they're living off of government welfare. We're paying our taxes for these people who aren't legally here. 100% not true. In fact, the government will give no aid to anyone who's undocumented here, even with false social security cards. They are so sophisticated that they can track it and they realize it and there's no funding available for these people. You know the only thing the false social security card gets them? Is the right to pay taxes. And as they pay taxes, they're protected that, the, that, the, uh, that, that they will not be turned over for paying their taxes. In other words, that department keeps that silent. We just, they only can give, they can't receive. Now, they can get, somebody brought up, they can get medical attention because we have a policy that we do not deny anyone of medical treatment. And I don't think that's a problem. But they're not getting federal aid, they're not getting food stamps, they're not getting social security benefits, they're only paying into those things. In fact, in Iowa, This is speaking of illegal immigrants, which that's not a really good word. They'd rather us call them undocumented immigrants, okay? In Iowa, they've contributed 21 million in sales taxes and 9 million in property taxes every single year, receiving no benefits from the country, working jobs that most would not work. Federally, they've contributed $12 billion annually to Social Security that they cannot benefit from. And these are facts. You can take the PowerPoint if you want later, look them up. These are just solid facts. 
But what does the Bible say? Forget any of that. Forget all the facts. Forget whether it is a burden or not a burden. What does the Bible instruct us in regards to foreigners? Let's take a look. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 to 19 says, For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God who is not partial and he takes no bribes. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and he loves the what? The sojourner. That's another word for the stranger. That's another word for the person who doesn't belong. He loves them. He gives him food and clothing. And you're going to see Jesus pick up on this very passage later, speaking about what really matters to him when he comes. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. And you know, you could say that to the United States of America. We were not invited to come here. We were fleeing persecution. But all of a sudden, what our argument today is, oh, we're all filled up. We don't got room for anybody else that's fleeing. Psalms 146 verse 9 says, The Lord watches over the sojourner. Why is that not clicking? He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to destruction or ruin. Zacharias says it this way, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgment, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you despise or devise evil against another in your heart. But was that a popular message? Read what it says, but they refused to pay attention. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and they stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts like diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts as he had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. You know, I bet you you've heard a sermon or you've heard a talk or you've, you've thought of or you've heard somebody emphasize the widow. I bet you you've heard them talk about the orphans. But you know what we never hear is the strangers. Because it's not politically, it's not culturally popular to talk about. But God says he's going to judge every one of us on how we treat them. God says he cares for them and he watches over them. And he says that we need to remember that we too were sojourners. Jeremiah 22, 3-5 says, Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver from the hand of the oppressor him who has been robbed. And do no wrong or violence to the resident alien, the fatherless and the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you will indeed obey this word, then there shall enter the gates of this house kings who shall sit on the throne of David, riding in the chariots and on horses, they and their servants and their people. But if you will not obey these words... I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. I'm looking forward to one that comes from the house of David, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who will come riding on a white horse with victory till victory. And those who are with him are the faithful. Those who are with him are those who have cared for the orphans, have taken in the strangers, have visited those that are in prison. Those are the ones that will be with Jesus when he comes. Malachi 3.5 says it in very plain terms. He says, then I will draw near to you for judgment. We as Seventh-day Adventists believing in the three angels' message, and behold, the third angel came, and it was preaching the everlasting gospel to every kindred, nation, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice to fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. You should know this verse. For then I will draw near to you for judgment. The hour of judgment has come. I will be swift against the sorcerers. And we go, yeah, preach it, God. Those evil sorcerers. Okay. How about the adulterers? Yeah, we agree with that one. Against those who swear falsely. Yeah, yes, we get that, God. We understand that in the judgment. 
against those who oppress the hired worker and his wages, the widow, the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner. What does that sound like? Sounds like building walls to me. Sounds like making people feel unwelcome to me. It says that those people don't fear God. They don't fear God. Because God cares for these people. In fact, we are commanded by Jesus to love our neighbors without any caveats. There's, there's no excuse, there's no preference, there's no what, but not if this is the case. It just says love them. And you read, Becky, so beautifully the passage where Jesus defined a neighbor. And it just so happened it was a sojourner that was the better neighbor to the natural born Israelite. But because we hear in the news about these dangers, why don't we look at the facts? In fact, refugees have been admitted through the U.S. Refugee Admission Program are already subjected, and when I say already, that means since it started in 1980, to the most thorough vetting of any category of visitor or immigrant to the USA. I mean, what you're hearing is we need more vetting, more this and that, and we need to be careful. But notice that it has been the most thorough of any country in the world. Since the Refugee Act of 1980, pay attention, zero. Zero Americans have lost their life in a terrorist attack by a perpetrated refugee. Not even one. Yet what are we doing? We're promoting this idea of this fear that we might be harvesting people that are going to come here and do terrorist acts. But not even one have taken place from a refugee since 1980. The odds of an, of an average American being killed by a refugee turned terrorist are 1 in 3.6 billion. I think you have better odds to die just waking up in the morning and walking out your door than you do from an actual refugee to cause you harm. In fact, what about immigrants and crime? They've studied this and looked and they said that the overall immigrants who are incarcerated are at lower rates than U.S. citizens. In fact, incarceration rates among people ages 18 through 54 are as follows. 1.53% among native-born U.S. citizens, 0.47% among lawfully present immigrants, like refugees, 0.85% among unlawfully present. They're still lower than the other. So th does that mean that refugees and immigrants are just better people than we are? Not at all but they're more careful than we are. They don't want to get caught or in trouble. So if you actually go to like a refugee community or whatever, most of the time we're the ones riding their tails and getting all upset why they won't hurry up because they're going five under the speed limit. Most Americans think they can go five over the speed limit. Is that true or not? They're just being more careful to obey the, the laws of the land. Because they're afraid that if they mess up, I mean, when, you're, when you don't feel welcome somewhere, you're afraid, man, if I do anything, I'm going to wear out my welcome. I'm going to be kicked out of here. So they tote the line a little straighter. While the unlawfully present population has tripled from 1990 to 2013, violent crime rates actually fell by 48% nationally. Guys, these arguments are not founded or true. We are commanded to be subject to governing authorities. And so I'm not here preaching that, that we should break the laws and that it's okay to come here without proper documentation and all those things. Not at all. What I'm trying to preach here is what is the job of the church with people that have come into this country, whether legally or not, how should we welcome them and how should we treat them? We should encourage them to follow the laws. But there's a lot of misunderstanding of that, too. In fact, about 70% of immigrants in the U.S. are lawfully present, even though people say different things in that 
70 percent. That's the large majority of everybody that's here is actually legally here. Including all who are admitted as refugees. There's a lot of ignorance. Oh, they don't speak English, so they must not be legally here. As a refugee, there's no, you have to speak English. You're fleeing for your life. They come here, they're dropped off, and they're hoping that someone will come and show them how to open the door to the microwave, how to live life, how to learn to be here. Among the roughly 11 million immigrants who are unlawfully present in the U.S., nearly half of them entered on a temporary visa but just overstayed. And they come from all over the world, not just from Mexico. You could put the wall up, it's not going to stop undocumented people here. Many, the majority of them have come here legally. They just stayed past and didn't renew it or didn't pursue any further with that. But I want you to understand the current law, because everybody goes, well, why don't they just do it legally? Do you know the law? Do you know how difficult that actually is? Under the current law, you have to have a family sponsor in order to come here. You have to have an employer sponsor. You have to be listed as a refugee. Or, how many of you guys like the odds of the lottery? No? What if your life was dependent upon a lottery choice? Because that's really the only other way you can get here. When we extend compassion to persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus says we do it to him. Amen. Notice what Jesus says. This is a little hard for you to read up there, but you can look in your Bibles. Matthew 25, 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. Are we not looking forward to that? What is our name, by the way? We are Adventists which simply means that we are looking forward to the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when He will come and He will put an end to the suffering. He will put an end to the tears. He will put an end to death. And we will once again live with a perf in perfect harmony with a perfect God in perfect communion with that God and with each other. Aren't we looking forward to that? There'll be no more death, no more sickness, no more pain, no more suffering. So Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory, the, the, the very thing that we're looking forward to, and all the angels with Him, what a glorious sight that will be. One angel caused the hardened Roman soldiers to fall trembling as dead men at Jesus' tomb. All of them are coming. Then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all nations. And He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats he'll put on the left side. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. The little word there is an alien. And you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them and say, truly I say unto you and that you have done it to the least of these. You know what it means by the least of these? Usually least is the ones people don't favor much. Don't look to the world, my friends, to find out how we should respond to these people who are born in the image of God, who Jesus died for on the cross, that we are to take the everlasting gospel to. They should find these as refuge asylums. Our church should be a place that they flock to, to hear the words of God, to learn what it means to be a Christian so that even if they do get sent back to their countries, may they go back and say, I have met the Lord and He is good. 
He cared for me when I was running and hiding, when I didn't know him, when I was living my life outside of, the, of his ways. He cared for me. And now I know that even though I'm back here where, where my brothers and sisters have been sniffing paint to get through the days, who have no income and all these things and are persecuted and, and are left and abandoned, I know Jesus won't abandon me. I met the Lord. That's the heart of Jesus. That's what he wants. But let's just get the facts straight. When we talk about refugees that America hand selects, guess who they are mainly selecting from these other countries? Look at the chart. Can you read it? The biggest pie there says Christians. That means in all these dangerous countries, there are people who are, Christ, or who are being uh, persecuted for their religious belief of Christianity, and the United States says, oh, we want them. And they take them, and those are the largest number of refugees that come from all these countries. There are some Muslims, there are some Buddhists and Hindus and Jews and, and others, but the largest majority of them are actually Christians or professing that they believe in Jesus Christ. Why is this important that I'm saying this to you? Because there's been a major shift. You see, in 2016, is that that long ago? The United States, and we bring in the least amount of refugees, period. We took in 42,105 Christian refugees. That means these people were facing life and death Every single day, they had to spend over three years in a poor, desolate refugee camp before they were selected and vetted through and came here to the United States. Those are your Christian brothers that believe in Jesus Christ. We took in 42,000 in 2016. As of June 30, 2018, we've only taken in 7,600. Why? Why? because we might be taking in a terrorist. Though there's not been a single act of terrorism from a single refugee since 1980. They're still suffering over there in those countries that are being labeled as terrorist countries. You know who they're terrorizing is the Christians that we're not letting come in this country. Christians from countries where Christians were facing high or the most extreme persecution, according to the Open Doors USA 2017 watch list, we took in, in 2016, 16,000 of those. That's the most extreme it can get. We've cut that back in 2018 to 1,912. What are we doing? We're turning a cold shoulder. By welcoming those who are not yet believers, because they're not all Christians that come, we have opportunities to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that is within us to make disciples of all nations. Yes or no? Yeah. Among people of non-Christian religious traditions in North America, most of these are refugees that, that but took this survey, or other immigrants, 60% say they do not personally know a Christian. Now, that's a sobering fact. You know what that tells me? That we don't care and we're not looking for them. They're here in America, and 60% of them says, I've never come across someone that's claimed to know Jesus Christ, that's told me anything about Jesus, that's shown me any type of hospitality, that's, that's actually come to me and said, hey, you're welcome here, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Lord and Savior I serve. 60% said they haven't heard it from anybody. Just 35% of white evangelicals in the U.S. say they personally know a Muslim, and even few know a Hindu or a Buddhist. Yet we took in 16,000 in 2016. Are they here? Yeah. Do you meet them every day? Yeah. They're all over, but are you getting to know them? Like Taryn was telling us, in the grocery stores, in the markets, in the places, are you saying hello? Find out who they are, where they came from. 
I think this is a powerful quote to think about. Something is missionally malignant whenever we are willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group, but we are not willing to walk across the street. Yes or no? So what can we do? I'd say number one, Glenn, thank you for your beautiful prayer. What do you think the first thing we should do? We should pray. If you're not asking God to show you someone that might be here, and if there's no immigrants here, even though Iowa takes in a lot, but if there's no immigrants here, then, you know, just be praying for those immigrants and those that are suffering and things like that. But I think you might be surprised if you pray and say, God, show me some. He might get you in contact with someone that might be a stranger, that might feel unwelcomed here. Do you know when they actually talk to people who are here, uh, whether legal or, or undocumented or documented, let's put it that way, do you know that most of them say that they don't feel welcomed by the churches? But when you talk to the churches, the churches are in shock. Like, what? Why are we not welcoming? It's because of all the political talk that they're saying. You know, we were counseled not to do that. Because the second you align yourself with a party, even if you don't believe everything that they're saying or you don't support everything that they're saying, someone else that hears that goes, oh, that church doesn't want me here. They want to put up a wall. They want to put up some sort of, they want to get me out of here. We were told, you know what we should talk about is issues. We shouldn't align ourselves with a political party or with a person, but we should vote issues, and that's it. We should vote things that are important and that keep religious freedom. Outside that, we shouldn't get into those discussions. You can have those personal opinions. You can do what you're going to do, but I wouldn't make it a public uh, church discussion. Why? Because all of a sudden now you're causing people to feel unwelcome. We should listen to them. That's what I heard Taryn doing. She was listening and you were listening, right? You guys were talking. But everybody has a story. We need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and we need to empower other churches and other people. And we do that by sharing, don't we? We need to be advocates for those that don't have a voice. We need to serve locally here in our field. We need to continue to preach and do evangelism. We should pray without ceasing. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but what's the problem? The labors are few. People are pouring in. We've been trying to reach the world. We've been trying to reach the closed windows forever, but guess what? Ever since they started pouring in here, the Christian church has been saying, shut the door. We don't want them here. Guys, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. We don't set the laws. We should encourage people to follow the laws. But remember, refugees are lawfully invited people that are here. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for how many people? All people. You don't know what their story is. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they're fleeing. You don't know what they've been trying to do, what they haven't been trying to do. Why don't you listen and pray? We should even pray for kings and all those who are in high positions that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every single way. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of war. There's a lot of problems going on in the world. Why can't we be a place a welcoming place, a refuge for people who are born in the image of God. What do you say? Put all political differences aside and what do we do? Who are they? God's appealing. He says, don't harden your hearts. And so I just want to give you guys an opportunity to respond. Maybe you've got a question. I'm not an expert in all this, but Maybe you've got a question. Maybe you've got a response to this. Maybe you were an immigrant and somebody took care of you and it welcomes you. Anything that you have to say, what's your response to what you've heard today? I just 
say if you take on those people, you need help yourself. Mm -hmm. Do we have a cordless mic we could pass? <clears throat> Don't forget that thought. <laughs> Here it comes. I'm going to say, years ago in our church. Is that odd? What? I don't hear it yet. Well, I can get up front and I can yell at him. <laughs> Christ, did he have one of these? He didn't. Huh? He didn't have one of those. Well, go for it. I think you're on now. Okay. Or maybe you're not. That's the first time I've had one of those in my head. Here, why don't you just use mine? Uh, okay. yeah, we, got, we got time. We're not going anywhere, are we? No, but just go ahead. I'm saying that a number of years ago, I took on some... They wasn't refugees, but they was from the uh, Appalachian Mountains, and they come to our place with nothing. And they said, how long can we stay? And I said, you can stay as long as you want to. Well, they stayed three months. And uh, I finally felt I couldn't really afford to keep them any longer. So I had to go to the church, but nobody gave me any money for help. And I was out of money. Put it, put it in there. OK, I was out of money. So. I went to the church, and so they finally said, well, we'll take up a collection. So they took up a collection and moved them. But they didn't have a job, and so I, after a while, I got some furniture, because I worked for uh, some people here in town that had apartment houses, and the basement was full of old stuff, the good stuff to them. So then what happened is, that I don't think they got any support, so they went back to Appalachians. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, and you know, thank you for and doing so what you nobody, did. Nobody, I mean, they look like a stoop after a while. Yep. In response that I'd say, you know, that, uh, you know, if you, if you read through some of what uh, Sister White wrote, and even early Adventism, this, this has been a problem all along. She says that God would send some poor person through that even was an Adventist, one of our ranks, and people would just turn away and wouldn't help. And there's been many cases of that. And that's why I'm speaking on what I'm speaking, is that we've got to change our mindset. Are they a burden to us? Are they a child of God? Yeah, it's going to be. It's going to be difficult. We're going to have to sacrifice, but... How many percentage of the pastors said that they believed that that was biblical, that we should sacrificially? But the problem is, is that it, it's not just the pastors. The church said, no, they're a burden. So we have, to, we have to evaluate that and see. I mean, yeah, there's a cost to everything. I mean, you know, we should teach them how to do things and provide for themselves and all that, or whatever we can. But people need help. And the question is, are we willing to give it? And I think that's going to say more about whether Christ is in our heart than anything else we do as a church, because that's what seems to be important to Jesus when he comes, is how did we treat the people that couldn't help themselves? The widows, aren't they considered usually a burden? The orphans and the strangers. Those seem to take the heart of God because he knows that they need our help. And how does the church usually respond to those groups? Praying for you. Have a nice day. Anybody other responses? Questions? Go ahead. It just comes to mind <clears throat> something that happened to me and it was either second or third grade here. 
uh, Vicki and I were best friends. And one day, um, a Japanese family came. And they had a little girl. And when we went out to recess, the little girl was by herself. And no one went over to her. I think it was the first time all of us saw someone that wasn't white. And I mean, as a little kid, I told Vicki, I just remember this so clearly, she's all alone, let's go meet her. And I think it was, looking back, I think it was fear of little kids because we had never seen anyone different at that point. But for quite a few years, the three of us were inseparable. We were mm. just beyond best friends because we took that first step. And it was weird at first, but it was neat. Amen. Amen. Taking that first step. Go ahead. Um, probably not many of you guys know this, but my mom actually left because my father was very abusive, and so we actually went to Michigan. I was very young at the time. I was six years old. Um, but we stayed in a shelter for quite some time that I can remember. And um, I remember when my mom was looking for a job, and people would come to drop off food and clothes and things like that. And granted, we probably couldn't repay it, knowing my mom, a single mom with three kids. Um, she couldn't repay that stuff. Um, and whoever gave it to us, and all, you know, they were out of money, they were out of their own food, whatever it was that they gave us. And when we think about those things, you remember that your treasure is in heaven. Because <laughs> I remember that when I was a little girl. Coming from a bad situation, being raised by this mom who didn't fully know English, who doing her best to raise three girls, and these people came and and we help someone, we're not expecting help back. That's not the reason why we give. It's not the reason why these people gave to my family. But God gives back. And he knows what you're giving. And he knows what your sacrifices are. And whether it's monetarily or not, or you don't get your refrigerator full again, or you're losing a little bit. Like I said, your treasure is in heaven. And those things are known by God. And when you get to where you're supposed to be, the money you spent on that is probably going to be not even in the back of your mind because you're going to be so happy that you did what God asked you to do. And knowing that people like my family remember that, and it doesn't matter to us. Yeah. I mean, I still, just like it was yesterday, remember this time when I was down in... Texas, me and Diane were there in the great state of Texas, the promised land. But it looked like the end of the world. Hurricane Katrina was, I can't remember if it was on its way or after, whatever, and all the gas stations were out of gas. People were lined up everywhere. And I remember me and Diane saw this couple there with a sign. And it said, pregnant need help. And we just, we kind of prayed about it and we both felt that we should take them and try to help them. And so we brought them to our house. And we heard more of their story and what happened. And I'll be honest with you, I was scared. The next day I got up and they weren't there and I was looking to see what they stole. I was nervous, but guess what? They had gotten up extra early so they could go and try to find a job. Hit my heart. Took them, they didn't look like people that the church would accept. I was scared when I took them with me to church. Had all sorts of piercings and tattoos and all that. But all the other churches had turned them away. They wanted to get home. They had left on their honeymoon, they made some, a few bad choices along the way, but ultimately their vehicle had broken down and they had no way to get home. 
So we took them to the church. In this case, the church did get an offering together, and we sent them home. They called and when they got there and said thank you, and I've not heard from them since, but my prayer was that the church there, because we were the only church that helped them, would the church there accept those people? Would they welcome them? You know, we talk about being a church, a hospital, a place of refuge, a place of healing. There's all sorts of people out there Pray and ask God, what is our part? What is your part? How can we help? We can't solve the world issues. But we can definitely show Jesus to someone, yes or no? Yeah? Any others before we sing our closing song, Give Me Jesus? All right, well, if I can get someone to come lead, it's not Give Me Jesus? Was it changed? It's okay. Who's doing the closing song? Tiara, is it Give Me Jesus or did you guys change it? What is it? Huh? 389? Oh, 289. So let's stand 289.